Okay, where are we? Oh, all over the map today, right? We're gonna go to Luke, we're gonna go to maybe John, a little bit of Matthew, maybe some, well, okay, let's go to Mark. Okay, what are your intentions? This is kind of an interesting one because I'm gonna go to Luke chapter 10. Well, let's, let's, let's what, I, what have I discovered in Mark chapter six? Actually, Mark chapter four, five, and six is really fascinating when you, when you meditate and get into the text. In chapter four, it's about your insight into the word of God. And he wants you to be insightful. He gives you the, the parable of the sower. And, and that's all he gives the people because he wants them to go meditate. He wants them to go think about this. What does this mean? And then the apostles say, hey, can you explain? We're not that brilliant. So he explains what it means. It's about the different soils that are out there. And then he gives them three beautiful parables, the bushel basket and the, and the light. You don't hide your light, uh, plant the seed. You don't know how se your seeds, when you plant them into the hearts of people, you don't know how they grow. And then the other one was the mustard seed. And then the good example, Mark always has a good example, is, well, he has a good example or a bad example, but the good example is the wind and the waves. Obey him. Now, now hang on to that parable of the sower, and then you jump down into chapter five, and you've got really three neat examples of soils, right? You, you got people responding. You've got the, the demoniac. You've got the uh, woman. Um, the demoniac, he was struggling without God. You got the woman that's got this bleeding problem. And then you've also got Jairus and his daughters dying. But all three come to God. They, they, had, they were bad soils, but now they've changed. And I think what we, you can pick up there in, in chapter five is identify what soil you are. And we're not all good soil. I'm sorry, we all have our struggles. And when you see that, change. Be inspired to change because you can change. And all three of those people are great inspiration that I can change. Which brings us to what are your intentions? Chapter six. And now, chapter six is again brilliant because he gives us three interesting examples of bad soil. The first soil was the Nazarenes. What was their intention? Their intention was to reject the Messiah. He grew up with us. So they totally put him off to the side. Their intention was not to change. They're like the seed that just ricocheted off. And then there was King Herod. What was his intention? Well, I'm going to protect John from the wife. But when I put him out, when I make a foolish vow, well, I'm not going to protect John. I'm going to kill him. So he kills the messenger, right? Because he, he, he kept calling for John and they kept talking, but he was rocky soil. He wasn't letting it get down into him. And then when it comes, when it comes to being out there in front of all his people, he says, no, kill him. Kill the messenger. And then the third one was the apostles. What was their intention? Well, their intention wasn't to go to work. We love following Christ, but guess what? Christ wants us to go to work. We have to feed all these people. I, I'm not here to serve. I want to be up there. And so what did they do? They ignored the message, the message, the message, and they ignored the messenger. And they didn't learn anything from that whole experience. But then the, the good example is, the good soil is the people of Genezareth. What did they do? They saw, they accepted him. They loved the messenger and they loved the message and they ran everywhere through the area, brought people to Christ to be saved. They had good intentions. What are your intentions? Well, what does God expect from me? Now, this is kind of interesting because Mark chapter six is getting you to think about your intentions and make a decision. And it's something that you do in your heart. It's something you do for God. Nobody else knows your intentions. Intentions are your objectives, are your goals, are your plans. What are your plans? Figure it out and then move on it. Mark chapter six, be like people of Genezareth. 
Luke chapter 10, which if you understand how to break down the four gospels, lines up with Mark chapter six. And now I'm looking at Luke chapter 10 is, that's Jesus saying, what are your intentions? And this time from a thinking perspective, and actually, if you want to do your own investigation, go to Matthew chapter 11, because that's your intentions too, from, from your logic and your emotions. And what's really neat is John chapter 6 is, is, a pro, is talking about your intentions. It's kind of how they fit on top of each other, but they all have the same from a different perspective, which I think is brilliant. But in Luke chapter 10, Luke breaks things down in groups of nine. Matthew breaks things down into two groups of three, so he's got six. Mark breaks down things down into a three, and then a good example, and John breaks things down into a three. So it's, it's he's communicating from different perspectives. But just listen to, if you look at Luke chapter 10, it even breaks down, if you look at your chapter breaks, into a, you know, really a beautiful, uh, a, a beautiful nine and he starts off by sending out the 70s and how does he send people out they send them out in twos he doesn't send the whole group together and okay everybody i want you he sends them out in twos and if you see examples people are always going in twos or going in ones it's not a group thing it's an individual thing right and he sends them out and what are they looking for they're going to towns but th this is the interesting thing, he, you know, he, in verse five, whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in that house. So what's he saying? You're looking for a man of peace. You're looking for a people of peace. What is this thing, peace? Well, in, in Luke chapter one, we kind of see Zacharias when John is born in verse 76 says, and you child, John, will be called prophet of the most high for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways. That's John the Baptist, obviously. To give to this people the knowledge of salvation by forgiveness of their sins. How? Through baptism. That's what John's doing. Because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise, Christ from on high will visit us, to shine upon us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. The peace that Jesus brings is the peace between you and God, not between you and men. We're looking for people that are trying to find a relationship with, with God. We see it again in verse 14 of chapter 2, glory, the, the angels, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom God is pleased. Well, if you're going to please God, you're going to have a relationship with his son. And so I think that's kind of interesting. And I just want to camp on this just for a little bit more because Jesus talks about peace in chapter 19, verse 42, where he says, to the women is that yeah he approached Jer jerusalem and and saw the city and he oh no this is before he's talking about jerusalem not the women and he wept over the city and he said if you had known in this day even you the jews the things which make for peace but now they've been hidden from your eyes the things which make for peace is the salvation that jesus brought and then, I'm not finished, Luke 24, Jesus appears to the guys in the upper room. And what's the first thing he says to them? Peace be to you. Wow, that's the first thing he says, right? And then, well, wait a second, what about Paul? Romans chapter one, verse seven. I'm not going to look it up. Why? Because he does it in every one of his letters. Grace and peace from God. Whoa. That's who we're looking for. That's who we're trying to help. Are people that are looking for that relationship with God.
people that are seeking peace, peace to this house, peace to the people that we're trying to reach, express the word peace to them. What are you talking about peace? Well, are you in a relationship with God? Like, that's what I'm about. And if you want, we can talk and I can share the word. And if not, then that's fine, right? And if, if they don't receive, shake the dust. That's verse 10 through verse 16. So, so he's saying, look, if you got love, if you got the love of God in you, seek for people that are, that are looking for peace. They're hard to find in this day and age. You're not going to baptize 3,000 people. Because those people had traveled across the world to be there on the day of Pentecost. Why? Because they're looking for that relationship with God. And then they find it with the sermon with Peter. That's amazing. You don't find that many people out there looking. But there are people that are looking. So you keep planting the seed out there. When you find somebody, then you encourage them to get into a study. But if they don't receive you, shake the dust. That's verse 10 through verse 16. And remember this, verse 16, the one who listens to me and the one who reject, one who, the one who listens to you listens to me. It's not about you. And the one who rejects you rejects me. And he rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. If they reject you, it ain't, it ain't about you. It ain't about the things that you said or that. You represent. You're the ambassador to Christ. You don't have to say things perfectly. They know when you start talking, they know what you're about. And they want to learn more or they don't want to learn more. But it's not because you have a gifted speech or you have great incredible insights because you care about them and this is what jesus is talking about what's your intentions is that your intentions now look at the next part which is i think about patience right they come back and oh the demons they're subjected to us and he says i was watching tape that's nothing i was watching satan but here look at verse 20 and highlight that one do not rejoice because Satan, right? Oh, I'm sorry. This is, this is about peace. <laughs> I'm, I'm jumping ahead. This is not patience. This is about peace, 17, 17 to 20. This is about the peace comes when you share the word of God. And he's saying, do not rejoice because what you do with the demons or you, you, you're sharing the word of God. That the spirits are subject to you. What are you supposed to rejoice in? When you come together as a unit, as a body of Christ, what are you supposed to rejoice in? Your names are recorded in heaven. There's where you take your great joy. Like, we come together because we few, we happy few. I hope you're happy. If you're not, you're, and you're a miserable Christian, I don't know, what's your problem? You've got salvation. People need to see you've got that. And they need to hear it. Anybody can complain. Everybody in the world does complain and drag everything down through the dust. But we don't, right? Hold fast the confession of our, of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds not forsaking the assembling together as as the habit of some but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near when you come together are you thankful seriously are you thankful you're a christian now in that happiness now you continue to reach out to find a person of peace yes but man, rejoice. Your name's written in the book of life. And understand that neighbor of yours, his name's not written in the book of life. So what am I going to think about? How to reach him? You figure out how to reach your neighbor. I'll figure out how to reach my neighbor. And when you find something successful, then when we come together, we encourage one another. That's what we get together for. Because I get beat up pretty good out there in the world. And the world is a great place to beat me up. But don't beat me up here. Don't beat me up. This is family. Encourage. 
be thankful. What are your intentions? That, the patience, is really cool. 21 to 22, I praise you, Father of heaven, that you have hidden, hidden. What's wrong with the people in this world? Well, it's been hidden from the wise and the intelligent. So, how many people do you meet are just, oh, they're so smart. Well, they're not really smart, but they're totally arrogant, right? The truth is hidden from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. <laughs> I'm not sure if I like that. <laughs> I'm just an infant. Now, capture this. Who's your father? God. Okay, so how much do you know? <laughs> You're an infant. <laughs> you don't know hard in comparison to what he knows. What do you know? <laughs> well, the only thing I know is what he's told me in this book. Well, then how much do you know? How much do you feed on this book? And that, if you study John chapter 6, is all about I am. Well, we'll talk to it, but I get to it. Yeah, I do get to it. Sorry. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son. Now, underline this, any, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal. Oh, yeah, sure, you got a Bible, great. But do you think because of your brilliance that you can understand it? Do you think you can just, do you think people can, what he's, what's he saying there? Well, I control what you learn. Because I know what? I know your heart. Right? And I know where you're going. And if I know your heart, I know your intentions. What are your intentions? Are you, are, are you trying to learn more? Are you trying to be pleasing to God? Or what are your intentions? Do I want to look good in front of other people? What are my intentions? James chapter 1, verse 5. Do I follow up with, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. If I don't understand how to reach my neighbor, am I talking to God? Or am I back banging my head up against a wall? It's between you and God and your neighbor. And he's saying, you better start praying and asking for the wisdom. And have patience. Because maybe there's something else you need to know before you're starting to reach out to this person. And if you're going to make disciples as we're called to do, are you a really good disciple? And if you have, okay, the neighbor says, let's have a Bible study. What are you going to teach him? Do you know what you're going to teach him? Do you know what avenue you're going to go down? Are you prepared? What are your intentions? What are your goals? What are your objectives? Things to think about, right? Oh, I love this. Kindness, verse 23. Remember what I said, when you get, get, get together in church, rejoice because your name is written in heaven. Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. Do you, do you really understand how blessed you are? For I say that prophets, Old Testament prophets and kings, King David, King Solomon, wished to see the things which you see and did not see, did not perceive, did not, and to hear the things which you hear and did not. Now, he's not talking to the disciples there. He's talking to us in this very day and age. We have this most incredible book. And when you read it, or do you read it with such an excitement? You're a child of God, and he's the one that opens things up for you. 
And more than a child of God, you're a disciple, which means you're a student. How much are your eyes filling up with this incredible word? Oh, did I say I was going to go to John? Yeah, I did say, right? John chapter 6, which so, to me, so aligns with this, this text here. What are my intentions? Well, he says, verse 53, Truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you've got Unless you do that, you have no life in yourselves. No life. What's he talking about? He's talking about studying the scriptures. He who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. I got baptized. I got to, you can lose it. For my flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. He's not talking large table here. He who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread, yeah. He who feeds on this word will live forever. Can you imagine what we would look like if this was the only food that we were given? Like, if we could see each other spiritually, how many of us would be healthy? And how many of us would be just skinny as a rail, starving to death? Because the only time they even read the scriptures is when they're in church. How much do you feed upon this? This is what God's looking at you. You, you want to reach out and help the neighbor? Well, then you better have something in your in your repertoire of teachings to be able to help the neighbor and then because he says this what happens people start leaving oh wait a second we were just here for the free food now you want us to work what does jesus say you want to go away also do you what does peter say where, where, where can we go you have the words of eternal life this is this is the only place to feed if we're going to survive, this is the only place, right? You're a child of God. Feed on him. Feed on him all the time. If you don't, well, you're going to be distracted because you're chasing after other things. What are your thoughts and intentions? Sorry. Goodness. Uh, here comes this lawyer. And it's kind of interesting because in... Matthew and, and Mark, it's a rich guy. And Jesus says, look, what, what, do I, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Well, look, just do you keep the commandments? Okay, the non, but keeping the commandments is good. But sell everything you got and give to the poor. And he couldn't do that. But here we have another guy coming up in Luke. As a matter of fact, Luke records the rich man later on. Here's the lawyer. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in the law? And this guy's got a brilliant answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live, right? Love God by showing respect to God, feeding on his word, getting into a solid relationship, and now go love your neighbor is what God calls us to do. And you know, some people, it's okay if the neighbors think highly of you. It's okay if you're out there reaching out and the neighbor knows you're a Christian and the, you want the neighbor to un see you and know who you are and appreciate you in their neighborhood, right? That's, do you know your neighbor? <laughs> uh, I sound like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> do you know your neighbor? I should have a green sweater on, you know, with the buttons up kind of thing. I got to go watch Tom Hanks and Mr. Rogers kind of thing. But you, 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 you want to be out there loving your neighbor, which is what the guy says, right? Sliding into faithfulness. Who's my neighbor? Okay, let's talk about it. A man's going down the Jerusalem to Jericho fell among the robbers. They stripped him, beat him. And what happens? Here comes a priest going down the road. He passes by. Here comes a Levite. He passes by. Here is God's people. And here is an opportunity for God's people to step up and do something. And what do they do? 
They avoid at all cost an opportunity and they walk on the other side of the road. How are you doing for that? Here's an opportunity. Do we avoid at all cost an opportunity to get into a conversation? And it doesn't have to be a biblical conversation. Do we have a, do we do at all cost to get into a conversation with our neighbors? And if we see somebody struggling, do we make the attempt or do we avoid, avoid? Don't go down that row on at Walmart or at the grocery store. Go the other way. Look, there's somebody in trouble. Go, you know. I remember it was really sad because it was showing a picture of a, a guy walking down the street and along comes this kid and he's got this and they're filming it. The kid's got a brick in his hand and he just walks up behind this guy and he smokes him from the back of the head. And the guy just, he's decked and he's, he's out. And what are they doing? Oh, get that. Did you get that in that? Oh, oh, is that ever sad? Oh, and they just filmed it all. Then they walked away. Wow. And then they walked away. Opportunity. Opportunity. Are we eyes open for opportunity? Who's your neighbor? Here comes that Samaritan right what's this you need gentleness now this is kind of interesting gentleness is so important why gentleness is knowing you're walking into a situation where you're going to get confronted where you could be you could get hurt that's what the samaritan does he bandaged up his wounds pouring oil wine puts him on his own beast brought him to an inn took care of him brings out more money Give it, gives it to the innkeeper, takes care of him. Whatever you spend on him, when I come back, I will repay you. Wow, you spend, you take, bring him to safety. You spend the night with him to make sure he's good. Then you make sure he's got a place to stay for a couple of days till he can recover and get back on his feet. This guy was hurting, but you still have to do your journey. But he delays his journey to take care of a fellow human being. And he drops. In this day and age, he drops five, six hundred bucks. Uh, did he get into a Bible study? <clears throat> no. He was there to help. That's it. Right? Who's the, who's the neighbor? Well, the one who showed mercy. Well, then go and do the same. Do, do we have to be into a Bible study to show sympathy and mercy to other people? Absolutely not when you're when you're pouring out the gentleness when when you're doing things in the community people will see those things and when they're looking when they're hurting they know where to come are you ready for when they do come and they're what are your intentions and and this isn't a handout e either I think we have a tendency to flip somebody a toonie because he's standing at the street corner begging and he's, he's hauling in 20 bucks every time the cars stop. Oh, quick, quick. That'll, that'll ease my conscience. I think the Good Samaritan is talking something totally different. Don't ease your conscience with simple things. Get, try to get into a conversation. Reach out to the street people. Sit down on the corner. Talk to them. Right? Flipping them a toonie. Don't let that ease your conscience. I should know. I've eased my conscience before. We're not talking handouts. We're talking being serious and getting involved and spending your money. And not for a Bible study, but because a person needs you and to be there for others. But I'm busy. No, you're not. And then finally, let's wrap this up. Let's go full circle. In this chapter, full circle. <laughs> see? <laughs> Blessed are the eyes we see. The things you see. Because now we're going to go into a house of a man of peace. They're, they're traveling. They enter a village and there's Martha. Welcomes. Come on. She welcomes. Stay where you are it so fits 
And she's got Mary, who's seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha's distracted with all her preparations, right? But here's a house of peace. And here's a woman of peace, Mary. And she's at the feet. And she, what's she doing? She's listening to every word. You know, I can't get enough. I'm not worried about those things. I'm, right? What is Martha said, you know, Lord, tell her to help me. And what if Jesus says, you're, you're worried and bothered about so many things. And aren't we in this day and age worried and bothered about so many things? It's kind of like getting back to the parable of, 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 the, of the sower. We've got weeds growing up and they're choking us out or I'm not dropping roots in. I'm so busy with this world. I'm not being planted out in the field. You're, you're so worried and bothered about so many things. One thing, one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away. One thing's necessary. Get grounded in the word of God. Feed upon the word of God. And when you do that, you'll have something to give to other people. Mary knew what was so important. Now catch this. You don't see Mary a lot. But when you do, John chapter 11, their brother's sick. Jesus is going to go up and visit. When he gets there, Martha's coming down. But note this. Martha goes and visits Jesus and sees him, right? Nobody goes with, with Martha. But when Mary gets up, chapter 11 verse 31 then the jews who were with her in the house and consoling her when they saw that mary got up quickly and went out they followed her supposing she was going to to, to the tomb to weep there mary's got a following why do you think that well i think it's because what she learns from christ she was relaying to other people and I think when they heard that her brother died, they were coming up to see what, what's Mary going to say. They didn't follow Martha. Martha didn't have anything to share with people, but Mary did. And when Mary came to where Jesus was, she saw him and, wow, she plants herself at his feet again. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Wow, she plants herself at his feet again because she knows. She's upset because her brother's died, dead, and she's not blaming Christ because she knows she puts her full faith in him. But there she is, bowing down before Christ. And then drop over to chapter 12. Jesus shows up and again, he's at Mary and Martha's house. And again, Martha's what? Making dinner, busy serving. Where's Mary? Verse 3, took a pound of very costly perfume, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. There she is again at his feet, at the master's feet, because she knows. She knows the one who feeds her. She knows the one to follow. And then if you just simply drop over to what? Mark chapter what uh, verse 14 chapter chapter verse chapter verse no verse no chapter 14 what is it verse 3 yeah at the home of simon the leper in bethany reclining at the table here comes mary here came a woman with an alabaster vial of costly perfume and she broke the vial and, and covered it over his head let her alone. Why do you bother her? She's done a good deed. You'll always have the poor. And whenever you wish, you can do good to them. But that's kind of interesting. Whenever you wish, you can do good to them. <laughs> but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached, in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of me. Spoken of in memory of her. You don't see a lot of Mary, but she certainly does an awful lot. She learns here in Luke chapter 10, where she first meets him. 
She learns to listen. She plants herself at his feet. Nothing else in this world is more important than to learn from the master. What are her intentions? Whoa! To take as much as she can from him. And when she does, she shares that with others. Was she converting anybody? No, but she certainly was catching a following. And people appreciated her very much, more so than Martha. Martha didn't have anything to share other than food. Let's have a potluck. Let's have a barbecue. Hey, I'm not against barbecues and potlucks. But when they got together for fellowship, fellowship was studying the word, enriching one another with the word, because that's what feeds you so you can have something to feed others. So brilliant how these four chapters, Matthew 11, oh, read Matthew 11 and, and match it up with Luke 10 and look at all the similarities that are connecting in that. Look at John chapter six and how he's saying, you need to feed because th these are the words of eternal life. Are you starving yourself for eternal life or are you feeding yourself? Are you feeding enough? You've got something to share with others? What are your objectives, your goals, your plans? I really appreciate what Christ is doing, how he puts all, well, the Holy Spirit, Christ, God the Father, they're all the same. How he's trying to communicate to us, get us to think about what are my goals? And how do I go about accomplishing them? You're not going to learn this from anybody else but you're certainly gonna learn it from Christ. And you need to take it and you need to make it your own and apply it how you live your life. He's the master, he's the teacher. We need to learn to listen to him. Be a person of peace. Look for people that are looking for that relationship. If they don't receive you, don't take it personal, right? Rejoice that your name, rejoice that your sins are forgiven. Your name's written in heaven. Get excited about that. Encourage one another about that. And understand that you're just an infant. But Jesus will, in time, give you wisdom and insight. If you are praying and studying, God will open things up. If you don't want to study and pray, well, guess what? Don't expect anything. And how truly blessed you are to see the things that you can see that kings and prophets couldn't. Let me tell you, they would so abide in this word. Right? And then share. Love your neighbor. And don't be judgmental who your neighbor is. Your neighbor is absolutely anybody that needs a helping hand. And be sacrificial. Be prepared. Remember we talked about that before. Do you got money in the bank that you can freely part with without worrying about? Have you set something up in the house that you can give away when you see somebody in need? Or, oh, well, I wish I could, uh, but I can't. I wish I, you know, people like to say, I wish I could, but I can't. But we should be a prepared people. I, I think he says that someplace over in Titus, prepared for. Yeah. Prepared for good deeds. Look that word up, good deeds in Titus. And how, if you're a Christian, you are prepared for good deeds. And then self-control. With self-control with Martha and Mary, Mary knew when she had opportunity to set her mind on the things of God. And she said no to those other things. We need to be able to say no to those other things because those other things will distract us. Those other things are, are, are important, but they're not vital to our salvation. What are you allowing to get in the way of your salvation and, and, and what you can share with, with others? Mary knew, Martha didn't. Mary has good rapport with the scriptures. Read John 11 and 12. Not so with Martha. How will it be for me? Will he say, well done, good and faithful servant. 
Luke pushes that narrative. What am I doing with the blessings that God has bestowed upon me in helping others to see God living in me, helping others to make friendships, to get opportunities to teach? What are, what are my intentions, my objectives, goals? That's what I need to ask myself. And that's what we need to ask ourselves. That's a lesson. 